All right then. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, what I want to talk about today is a, is a little library that I wrote. It's a rules engines library. And you, you see the name here on the slide and here's the first piece of advice straight away. When you create a library, choose a name that you can pronounce. <laughs> when I chose it, I, I didn't actually know how to pronounce it. So I had to research it. Uh, it's meaning plus the Japanese word for chain, which I believe is pronounced kusari. So the, the, the full name of the library will be Mini Kisari. Um, it's, a, it's a forward chaining rules engine. Um, and before we get into the details, let me get the imposter syndrome out of the way. Um, I'm not an expert on rules engines or forward chaining inference by any stretch of imagination. Uh, and I've done a little bit of it. Um, and I, no, I learned something about them. Um, something that makes me slightly better about it is that I spoke to, uh, to a friend of mine that actually implemented a couple of rules engines and read papers about them. And uh, when I asked him for advice, he said, no, 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 but I'm not expert either. So I think it's a, it's a recursive imposter syndrome that goes probably all the way to the first creators of the Riti algorithm. Um, in general, because rules engines you know, to the core are actually Part, you know, they're complicated algorithm, uh, mainly because the way to implement them correctly is to use uh, something like constraint propagation to make them efficient. Um, so you can recompute rules uh, in a fast way. Um, and the purpose of this library is to ignore all of that and try to instead stay familiar. So I wanted something that um, looked a bit like other things that I'd used before. Um, and again, Richiki is perfectly right on how important is familiarity in the tools that we choose. Um, the hard thing is to make something that is unfamiliar familiar, um, no matter how complex, complected, or decomplected that is. So the, there's a need to bridge that gap. And so I picked DataScript. Um, as a, as a host for the, the rules engine library. And mainly because I do love DataScript. I think it's a, it's a fantastic uh, piece of software. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, reverse engineering feat. Uh, for those of you that maybe don't know, it's, a, it's an open source implementation of a data log engine uh, similar to Datomic. And DataScript is, is the kind of library that I which I wrote on. I think everyone has that, you know, that you see a library and you think, ah, oh, I wish I was the author of that one. So I think it, it's, it's brilliant. Um, and the reason that I think it's brilliant is that compared to the Atomic, the Atomic is huge. Um, it's, a, it's an enterprise you know, software library. It's a, it has to cater to many use cases. It has to have you know, a lot of configuration. Um, working in you know, many different settings, it you know, has to be production ready and maybe sacrifice a little bit of elegance for performance. Um, and that is true of pretty much every enterprise level software. And compared to that, the genius idea about DataScript is that it tries to do less, it wants to be smaller and slightly less powerful. So it, it, the author of DataScript didn't aim for a one-to-one -one copy. He said, okay, I like some of the ideas and I'll implement them and make the whole thing less powerful and less complex. And so that opens the door for so many things. Like you can embed DataScript in the browser, you can use it you know, with React, uh, you have a simplified schema, you have a simplified you know, storage. Uh, protocol, you can just write the whole database to file and read it again, if you like. Um, and all the tutorials on the, the Atomic website can't beat being able to learn data log um, on your browser. So you, you can have tutorials about the Atomic using DataScript um, interactively, which is something that is quite hard to do if you, uh, if you use the Atomic itself. And generally speaking, when you organize software, 
Now it's classic Yagni. Maybe you start with DataScript uh, to hack something together for your hobby project, and you know, later on you adopt Datomic. Or maybe not. Maybe you discover that that's exactly what you need for uh, for your project, um, and you don't need to learn something more complicated, something more powerful. So it's in that spirit that I build Minixari. Uh, the library gives you a feeling of working with a with a full rules engine, without trying to be too clever, too complex, or too performant or too production ready. It doesn't require you to understand how the RETI algorithm works and tries to stay familiar. So it builds on top of DataScript um, in a way that if you know DataScript, you know how to use this library. And again, you can use it for your hobby project or to try something out. Uh, and maybe you decide you need something more powerful. So in a way, that's a stepping stone to a proper rules engines library. It's fine. Or maybe you discover that that's exactly what you needed and you can integrate it in your project. Um, and I know there's been a talk in the past from um, about Clara rules. So I'm um, not going to spend too much time explaining rules engines. But in a way, if you think the traditional programming is, um, we use a metaphor for traditional programming as uh, cooking a recipe, um, cooking food, following an algorithm, a step of procedures. Um, you do something, then you do something else. And then maybe in the meantime, you prepare other things. And then at some point, to half prepared meals, maybe joined in the same dish. Um, that's how we normally think about programming as following um, a recipe. For rules engines, um, it works in a different way. If you have a rule, a when, a when condition and a then condition. On the left hand side, part of that rule is matched. It's true in the, um, in the set of facts that you have about the words. Then you execute the the right hand side part of the of the rule, which could be adding more facts to the database or removing some facts from the database. And rules engines, you, you may have heard um, them being called expert systems sometimes. Um, and one of the reasons is that they they were used um, originally also to model the thinking process of experts, um, specifically doctors, lawyers, where their thinking doesn't necessarily follow a procedural um, set of steps, but rather they collect some facts, uh, you know, blood pressure, where has the patient been in the last six months, and they might make assumptions, okay, maybe I should you know, do these diagnoses, and then they follow a specific path in their reasoning, they, they follow a, a path in the um, solution tree. And gather new facts, um, and then more rules apply, and maybe they decide that that wasn't the correct path to follow for the reasoning, so they may backtrack and follow down another path. So it's, it's constantly a process of accumulating facts, having some rules that tell you in which direction to go, maybe make some assumptions, and gather new facts and decide whether that plan was a good idea or not, and maybe follow a different direction. And another way that it might be described as uh, rules engines are um, as forward chaining inference. And the analogy here is that is the opposite of backward chaining inference. If you use a database engine, you have a sense of what a backward chaining inference might be. So SQL is not a good example, but it's a, it's a good metaphor. You, you have a database of facts, and then you, you write a rule, you, you specify a way that um, that says you know, things should be structured in this way, and then the engine goes ahead and finds in the database the facts that match that rule. Uh, this is not true in, in SQL, it's not proper backward chaining inference, but in a system like uh, Prolog, it works exactly that way. You specify your rules, and then it's part of the, it's the job of the program to go and find the facts that um, make those rules true. And forward chaining inference is the opposite of that. You have a database of facts, a set of rules, and then you produce more facts uh, when you match the rules against the database. And more facts can be saying something is not true anymore. So it's, uh, 
in theory, strictly additive. So you, you keep adding new information to the system. Okay, so that was introduction code now. Um, so as I said, it builds on top of data script. So you need to be fairly familiar to how data script work. So just to revise a little bit of data script, um, the top form is a database with four people, the Doe family. And let's say we want to write a query that um, finds the, the full name of the people that have age greater than or equal 18. And this is how you would specify that in DataScript or Datomic. A couple of things to point out in case you're not super familiar. Uh, line 16, there is a function call inside the, um, the where clause. Um, and you can bind the result of that function call to another variable, in this case, the, the full name. So you're calling the function string, it gets the first and last name, you bind it to full, and then you can use the, the variable full for you know, other conditions. And if you don't bind it to anything, the, if you don't bind the function call to anything, in the case of uh, greater than or less, um, greater than or equal, um, it will expect it to, to match to true. So that's a Boolean predicate. And when you execute this query against the database, you get a set of facts that match that uh, query. So DataScript already has a way to specify when something matches something, and it has a syntax to transact facts to the database, add uh, or retract assertions. So what if we could use that to create a query? So query is something with a when and then, left-hand side, the right-hand side. When something matches the left-hand side, then produce what you have on your right-hand side. So this is what a query looks like in Unix Ari. The when part is exactly the same as the where condition in the query. And then the then part is a transaction vector. So you add or retract new entities to the database. So we execute this rule against the databases before. Uh, the then part, or the only thing that it does is attaches a um, new Boolean property to the person saying that we, we send them a voting ballot and creates a brand new ballot with the full name of that person. So when you execute that rule against the database, it matches for three people. And for those three people, ballot sent now is true. And there is a new ballot for each one of them. Um, if you're wondering what the string here is, instead of an integer ID, it's just a string temporary ID. So when you transact these six facts, um, the three new ballots don't conflict with themselves. They have a unique string ID. So the only thing that we need is basically these R, how to execute a rule against that DB. And it's pretty simple to do. You just need to shuffle things around. Um, you only need to convert this one into a where condition, get the results, and pass it into the, the right-hand side in the then condition. That's what R does. And this is pretty much the entire content of the library, I mean, sorry. It's just one function that does this data manipulation, and you can use it as a rules engine library. So being pretty small, what you can use it for? Um, you can use it for a lot of things that you normally use rules engines for. Um, as I was saying the, um, before the talk started to, to Bruno, my first exposure was um, with rules engines, was with Clips, trying to write a simulation of a Mars rover, exploring Mars and collecting rocks and bringing them back to, to the base. Um, so planning this route through you know, obstacles and then monitoring its own internal systems. And when it was running low on fuel, it had to go back to, to the base to recharge itself. And if there were uh, new obstacles, you know, boulder, or tornado, it had to reroute itself um, and choose a different path. And I think in this context, rules engines work perfectly. You, you have a database of facts, you have a certain set of rules. Um, based on these facts, you, you plan what to do next, and then you constantly monitor the system 
um, the external system, you know, obstacles in your path, or the internal systems running low on fuels, parts of the system are, uh, malfunctioning. And then when that new information comes in, it might trigger new rules that may say to you, okay, keep following that path or backtrack and plan again. And rules engines are also pretty good if you want to write games. Um, so that autonomous behavior of the, the mouse rover, well, that maps sort of one-to-one -one for um, non-player entities, for you know, autonomous characters in a game. But also in general, a lot of games don't have a lot of states. There's um, usually just a little bit of states, I don't know, an X, Y position for the characters in the game. But then when a new event comes in, you usually tend to derive a lot of additional state to make the rendering fast. Um, and this is true even in normal UIs using React. You, you don't want to do computations during a rendering time. Usually when you have new data, um, you save that data, but you also save a lot of derived information so that the rendering maps one-to-one -one with what you have on your memory database. Uh, and so for games, it makes a lot of sense to create uh, rules for when things changes. So with a rules engine, you, you can just say, um, this rule is interested in knowing the, the position X, Y of uh, that player and when the, the time changes. And when either of the two changes in the database recompute the, the final position of the, of the player. If you don't use rules engines, the, the way you traditionally do it in a functional way is you, you loop through all the entities in your game um, and you update them. So, for example, you loop through all the you know, flying objects in the game, you know, update the position using uh, you know, a gravity system. You go through all the projectile in the game and check whether there is a collision, a collision and so on and so forth. So, I think this, this is one thing that um, in the talk about Odoils, which is another of those engines, was highlighted really well. Even with functions, you have an implicit dependency. Some functions need to run before the other. Um, think about uh, ring middleware. Some ring middleware needs to be placed before another in order to work correctly. Um, and when you have a lot of them, it's quite easy to get them in the wrong order. With rules, you just say, I depend on these um, two or three variables and I recompute whenever they change. Uh, which also work, can work quite well for editors. Again, not a lot of state, but a lot of things that need to change whenever something, um, whenever a new input comes in. Um, and then again, like instead of having callbacks for extending your editors, you can write them as a sort of rule and say, now I'm interested in the user cursor position and whether there is any background computation. And when either of those change, I recompute and add to the, the global state uh, my new facts. And finally, in case you're not doing games or editors or mass rovers, um, rules are quite good as a way to decomplex or decouple systems. So if you have a payment system and you have a, a shipping system, um, whenever they change, they probably want to update the order system as well. And you can do that in a variety of ways. You can have hard-coded HTTP calls, you can, or you can post them in a SQS queue, or you can write a rule that says whenever the, the payment status in the payment system changes, then go ahead and um, assert some derived state in the order system to keep it up to date and to keep it in sync. Uh, you can do that in code, you can do that in function as well, but it's quite a declarative way of specifying these um, inter-system dependencies. Okay, time for a demo then. Um, in a way to simulate the, 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 the mouse rover, the planning and retracting and going down another path, um, which is that the classic problem of the eight queens, um, the socially distanced queens that cannot be on the same row and the same column in a chessboard uh, or on the same diagonal. You need to place eight of them in an eight by eight chessboard. So I just jump straight away to what the solution looks like. Uh, chessboard and we want to place the queen one after the other. And then if we discover that 
we cannot place the next queen. We want to backtrack and try another path. We'll go ahead and we'll place a few queens. And then you see at one point, it couldn't place the next queen. So it backtracked and went down another path. And that was impossible. So it attracts even more. And then finally, hopefully, not going to matter. And that's um, the proper solution. OK, so how do you implement something like this with Minix uh, In this case, I've implemented it with two rules. Um, we need a rule to place the next queen, and we need a rule to retract the current queen if we can't place the next one. Um, so it uses that when then structure um, and also an else key. This is mainly for a closure script because you cannot um, evaluate functions inside the binding vector um, because closure script doesn't have resolve for symbols. So you need to pass them explicitly. But in Datomic, for example, or in, in data script on the JVM, you could do without the RS key. You can just call fully namespaced function inside your binding vector. Uh, another thing that might not be familiar for everyone, uh, dollar sign is the implicit reference to the database. So we say the first rule, give me the current queen, and then find a valid position in the database for that queen so that it doesn't break social distance. And check that we haven't tried that position before. So each queen will have an X and Y, and we'll have also a list of tried position. Um, so we say what we tried, and we don't want to try it again. And if those match, then also give me the next queen and say that the next queen is now the current one, and also save the position for that queen. That's very easy. And then to retract, uh, we start the same as before. We negate what we were saying just before, that we cannot find the valid position for the queen that we haven't tried before. And in that case, give me the previous queen, get also the, the X position of that previous queen, retract the position of the previous queen, add the fact that you've tried it and you shouldn't try it again, and then set the current position of the queen as the, the previous one, and also cancel everything that we tried for the current queen, because now that we're replacing the previous queen, everything is valid again. And that's pretty much all you need to solve the eight queen problem. I'll show you the um, what is transacted in each step. So the first thing that we transact, so actually here we cheat a little bit. Here is a, is a vector. So we are actually transacting in one go all the possible position um, in, a, in a random way. And because data script only allows the, the last one to win, um, we're adding to the, um, to the queen just uh, the last value too. And then the next one, next one, next one. Just keep transacting the exposition for the queen until we can't add the queen anymore. And then we retract the position, mark that we tried it, and then reposition the, the previous queen again. And that's it for the queen. Oh, sorry. Um, but that was pretty easy, no? So you, you just call the rules engines on every click. What if we wanted something automatic that happens without user intervention, but also something that happens uh, with more derived data? So that there were only two rules and they were not depending on each other. Maybe we want a rule that adds some data and then after those uh, this information is being added to the database, more rules should fire as a consequence. And we want to iterate until we get to a stable point in the database. Uh, so I've refactored the Flappy Bird example that Pitwheel has um, using rules. In order to solve that, the thing that we need is a infer loop. Let me find it. OK, so we want to loop um, on the database. We want to first match the rules that apply, transact the data, 
and then feed the same rules again on the new database and see if more rules apply then transact with those rules and keep going until we get to a stable point in the database or we reach a max number of iteration. I mean, the loop is pretty simple, is doing exactly as I described. And the way this is possible without using retail algorithm is by referencing the max transaction in DataScript. So DataScript, whenever you transact something, it keeps um, it keeps a pointer of the greatest number of the latest transaction that has been added to the database. So if you want to transact something only once and avoid triggering a rule on every pass, you can just say, has this recently changed? Is this part of the max transaction, of the latest transaction? And in that case, then execute the, the right-hand side of the rules. So you see here, I've created three um, entry points. Um, whether you started the game, whether you pressed jump, or whether it's a background time update. And what they're doing is, uh, you know, changing some information and then the fact that there is a new game Delta, Delta a new um, game current time. And then once this has been transacted, then other rules can listen for those changes and saying, I'm interested in every time that the game um, game time delta changes. That way, I need to update the position of the flappy bird and update it in two different ways, whether it's active or inactive. At the beginning of the game, the bird goes in a sine wave pattern until you press the first jump. So this is how you do branching logic, for example. One rule is that um, triggers when active is true, and the other one triggers when active is false. And once you update, for example, the, uh, the bird and the position of the pillars, once this has been updated, then maybe you delete any pillars that went off screen, you, you add more pillars if you don't have enough in the game. And once this has been updated, then maybe you check for collisions. Once you check for collisions, you update the score. Probably easier to show that, to explain. So we have three buttons, three actions. We start um, increase time manually and then um, telling the bird to jump. So as we increase time, uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned, uh, you can use the current transaction in DataScript to add a little bit of metadata to debug, for example, which rule is executing. So as I have increased the time on the first pass, the time update rules triggers. And then that in turn and the second pass updates the position of Flappy and of the other pillars. Um, and you keep increasing the time. And then at one point, you may want to jump. The only thing that it does is flips the status of Flappy from inactive to active. So now if you increase the time, first it goes up and then falls down. And then after you update the position of Flappy, um, the check collision rules triggers. And this, because this is depth cards, I can also rewind the state and keep playing the game. So you see the pillars are moving to the left because they respond to game delta being updated. So that position must update. And this is how everything works together. with just rules execution. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Um, it's quite fun to just develop these things with a very low powered rules engine. Um, By its intention and its design, so I wanted to make Minixari mini very minimal, just, just one function, intentionally low power hosted, so the, the syntax is familiar and you you basically can use everything you know about DataScript and uh, create left-hand side and right-hand side rules with DataScript syntax and mostly data-driven. As I said, with ClojureScript, there's, um, there's no way to, um, to call resolve in the, um, in the where clauses. So you need to pass functions as values. Uh, but I also have a way to maybe make it work in a more data-driven way. And I'm 
happy to discuss that later. And as I said, if you if you play with it and then you discover that you need something with more power for your for your use cases, that's great. That that served this purpose. There are some really great Rules engines already implemented in Clojure. Uh, Clara, by far the most popular one. It's very battle tested, and it's a full implementation of Wiki algorithm that also um, stays very true to the um, to other systems that use Wiki like um, Clips, uh, Mimir from Hakan and Odoil, the, the latest one. Um, and Odoil syntax mainly was the inspiration behind uh, Minixari. I saw the, the shape of the rules in Odoil and said, yes, that's that's exactly what they should look like. Um, but wanted to have a similar syntax for something on top of data script rather than something on top of the uh, Wiki algorithm. And I think this way of not building on uh, Riti has a quite a, it's something that is very interesting for uh, UIs. I see something like Posh that binds data script queries to React components and have them re-render whenever the underlying query changes. Uh, there's possibly something to, to, to get from the library and probably insert into Minixari for optimal re-rendering. Um, and some exploration in the UI space in general with Riti is it's very interesting. Uh, what if you could update components in your UI instead of using the React loop uh, and checking which props changed in a full top-down tree? What if every element in your UI was, was basically backed by a rule and then you let the RT algorithm decide which component in your UI will render whenever the facts in your database change? So there's fact UI and precept to, to check for some effort in that area. And that's it. That's the end of the talk. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them.